Well, turn with me in the Bible to, um, to whatever scripture you'd like to turn to. And uh, no, I'm just teasing. Well, I think we're going to start in Colossians this morning. And so all of those that are here with us online, we welcome you, as Brother Lee said. We're glad that you're here with us. We have an online congregation. Uh, many of them live in different parts of, of, the, of the country. And uh, we have some people... And they, and they let us know. And, and a lot of them send their, their tithes and offerings in. Uh, and, but, and, you know, this is, this is their church. And they may be in a place where they don't have a really great church. And, uh, and so, you know, we're so glad for the technology to send this out to people. And if you're watching anywhere in the world today uh, and you'd like to listen in a different language, we have that available to you. We have uh, stream, li if you're live, now when you, you pull this up later on YouTube, it doesn't work because it's not live. But we have that QR code right there. You can, you can take a picture of that with your phone, and it'll take you to a site that you can listen to the message instantly in uh, 58 different languages. Most all of the major languages, you know, there's, uh, they're, and they're adding more as they go. Uh, and so we have that technology, we pay for it, so if you're live and you, hear, you can hear it better in, uh, in, in Spanish, you can go and listen to it there. If you're, if you're Russian or Czech or uh, what are some other ones that, that we have? Um, yeah, French, all of those. You can and it's instant. And so as I'm preaching, it's translated right there. Uh, through that new AI technology. Don't let that scare you. That's, all of that good technology is from God. It's the devil that twists it and make, makes it crazy. But, uh, but every good and every perfect gift comes from God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so we welcome all of our online audience. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 is where we're going to uh, start. And um, as you're finding that, let me just put in a little plug really quick for the marriage retreat that's coming up in November uh, we have it's not going to be a real huge um, we have plenty of room but we have 18 couple spots that are going to be uh, available that's going to be November 15th and 16th we'll announce it plenty of time because there is a cost involved uh, I think it's about 180 bucks or something like that but what you're going to get out of this conference is really going to be good we're going to give every couple that comes a free marriage assessment that uh, uh, that that uh, goes through about I think 18 different areas of your marriage and 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 sees it sees that that area is a strength or or a, a place that you need to work on and then we're going to teach you and facilitate you uh, how to do that uh, and and how to use that tool as a as a something that's really powerful in your marriage to grow in so Make a note of that November 15th and 16th. That's going to be a great time. The weather's going to be cool. How many of you have been enjoying the weather and cooling off a little bit? I kind of think it's going to heat back up a little bit. But I love walking out in the morning and feeling that breeze, and it's like 61 degrees, and that's like heaven to me. Praise the Lord. I love the fall. I like all of them, but it can get pretty hot down here in the south. All right, Colossians chapter 1. We have been on a series uh, called Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha is the name of the Lord. Uh, one of his names, Jehovah being the name that means Almighty God. Rapha means the, he is the Almighty God that heals you. And it reveals the part of the nature of God that he revealed through the whole Bible as healer he is the god that wants you healed amen in your physical body he wants you healed in your mind in your he wants you to have a sound mind a healed mind and no matter what's happened to you through your life if you have areas that need healing he wants to reveal himself to you as the lord your healer amen he wants you strong he wants you healed and so we've been talking about that, and we, uh, we had a little diagram. If they'll put that diagram up on the screen. We talked about how uh, there were some people in the Bible that Jesus referred to their faith as strong faith. 
uh, and he accredited miracles that happened, like with the woman with the issue of blood, with the uh, ten lepers uh, that went to show themselves to the priest. As they went, Jesus said that it was their faith that healed them. Now, most all the healings that took place in the life of Jesus in his three years here on the earth, you understand this, that when Jesus was here on the earth, he was the body of Christ. Now, we are the body of Christ. And his full intention is for the body to keep doing what the body did 2,000 years ago. The body has not changed. Amen? It's just that now we're a, we're a lot of people that are learning who and what that body is supposed to look like, and we're, we're getting equipped to step out and bring healing to other people. So I, I see a series like this that we're in right now uh, with, with several, there's, there's really several reasons why we need to get into these things. Number one, because people need healing. Everybody in here this morning needs healing in some way. In, whether it's your knee or your shoulder, or your ankle or your neck or your back or, or something uh, that you may be taking medicine for or, or your eyes are not as strong as they used to be. In some way, everybody in here needs healing. So, you know, faith comes when you understand what the will of God is and you know what he said about something. So we need to minister on healing so that people can be healed, right? Because you can't have faith unless you know what God said. And then your faith, not only, you not only, not only need to have faith, but your faith needs to get stronger. Your faith needs to be strengthened right? You need to have strong faith. You understand what I'm saying? Not weak faith. Not, not a, you shouldn't have to run to the Word to find out what God says about healing. As you grow in the things of God, your heart should be full of it. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say you're full of it. Amen. <laughs> so we get into series like this because people need healing. And when we minister on healing, God confirms his word with signs following. So we, we get into these things, not just to give people knowledge, but to get into an environment of miracles. Jesus was the greatest and will always be the greatest at going into a place, whether it was a home or a synagogue or out on the street, but he was a master and he was the greatest at creating an environment for miracles. He could walk into a, 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 a funeral procession and create an environment for a miracle. Amen? He, he could, he could uh, uh, be among uh, friends, or he could be among enemies, or he could be among tax collectors, which, like we said, was like the mafia of the day. Tax collectors could knock on your door and they, they, had, a, they had a record of what you owed and they, could, they had a, a, a reputation of taking more than what, what you owed. They could do that. And so they were hated. They were like the mafia. They could, they could come and take whatever they wanted. Well, Jesus went to a mafia party one time after he called Matthew the tax collector. But he was a tax collector. He called him to follow him. And then he went to a, a gathering of tax collectors and was persecuted for it. But you got to understand, his purpose was to walk into an environment and create an environment where people could connect with the Father. Amen? Now, the body's the same, which means that that's our job too. Our job is to, is to walk into an environment and change the environment. You're an environment changer. You're a culture changer. We don't just except what the culture has given us. Amen. We change it. We change it. And I know we can vote and things like that, and that's some natural things, but you've got the power of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you and the power of the Word working in you to walk into an environment and bring stability and bring healing and bring peace to that, whatever that environment is by being full of it. Right? You get full of it yourself. 
And then you walk in everywhere you go. You're just creating environments for miracles. Yeah. And if, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you'll, you'll learn from the expert. Yes, yes, yes. You'll learn what Jesus did. That's why we need to read things like that. And that's why, you know, in our, in our private time where we're reading the Word of God, read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and read to learn from the expert. Read to learn from Jesus. Amen? That's what he said. He said, if you're burned out and worn out and things aren't working in your life and you're about ready to quit, he said, come unto me and learn of me, he said. Why are you coming? To learn. We come to Jesus to learn. To learn what? Because he, he's our example of victory. He's our example uh, and model of the body of Christ. And now we're the body of Christ. He's the head. We're the body. Amen. Amen. So another reason why we get into things like this, this series called Jehovah Rapha, is because not only do we need healing, we need to get better at ministering healing. We need to get better at creating environments for miracles. We need to get better. Amen? We're learning. We're, coming, we're becoming stronger. We're, we're learning that this is not just so that I can enjoy it and consume it all on myself, but freely we have received, freely give. Hallelujah. And when we read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and we see Jesus going about doing good and healing all, we realize, okay, that's what I'm supposed to do. Because he was the body. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And now he's become the head, and now I'm the body. Amen. So the same body does the same works. Is that right? And so we together are the body of Christ, and we're an extension of his hand. We're an extension of his mouth. We're an extension of his miracles. And so when we come to church, we should come to be equipped to leave stronger, to leave better, to be, be sharper. Yeah. Hallelujah. More instructed, more focused, more determined with the vision and the goal to be the body of Christ to the world. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Encourage me. Right when I got to church this morning, I just started hearing testimonies of miracles through the motorcycle guys and through Steve, things going on in Steve's life. And I love that. And people are like, can I share this? I want to share what God's doing. And it's like, this is so awesome. Yes. It's so awesome to see God moving in our life. But we can take it up to a whole different level. And we can say, you know what? This is good, and I love it, and God's good, and he's blessed me, and he's healed me. I'm going to take this out and do this. Yes. Amen. Amen? And we have that authority. We have that power to do it. And so we talked about last week, uh, we talked about how faith, strong faith, and that's what we're, that's what we're getting, getting stronger at. Our faith is getting stronger. Strong faith rests on three pillars. It rests on three pillars, and each pillar is an area of knowledge in your life. And how well you know this and how established you get your heart in these areas of knowledge will determine how, how uh, faithfully and accurately you minister to other people. Amen. And so the first was a, was a pillar of the knowledge of what God has said. Strong faith sits on the, the pillar of the knowledge of what God has said. you got to know what He said. Amen. If you want to be strong in an area, you got to know what He said. What did He say? about healing. We're talking about Jehovah Rapha. We're talking about healing. But this applies to every area. What did he say about healing? You know what he said? We gave out, a, 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 I know we ran out of them, of the, the sheets of 101 things about what God said about healing. We've got more of those if you didn't get one. Take those. Meditate on them. Don't just commit them to memory. You will memorize them. But don't just try to commit them to memory. Get them in here. One of the things that God said he would do in the new covenant is he said, I would write things on your heart. Amen. I tr every time I get in a, a service or I listen to something, I trust, I release faith in the Holy Spirit to write things on my heart. And so a lot of the things of scriptures that I quote, that I don't quote them out of memory. They're in my heart. And the Holy Ghost is the one that pulls those things up. If I quote, you know, 25 scriptures, don't marvel at how, how great I've memorized scriptures. 
I couldn't do that in my own strength. But as, as the, and the Lord uses, he'll use you the same way as you trust him. I'm trusting you. He said, he said the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will bring things to your remembrance. Trust him to do that. That whenever you need the word, he'll bring that to your remembrance. I was talking to Steve this morning. Raise your hand, Steve. This is, this is Steve Veal. He's been coming to this church for so many years. But he, he was uh, going through some things, and the Lord was ministering to him on a certain thing, and the Lord just spoke a scripture to him. He had no idea what the scripture said. The Lord said, Acts 23, 1. Well, that didn't come from his mind. That's the Holy One that lives on the inside of him that knows that whole Bible. He knows everything God said. So this is not limited to our memory. This is just putting things in your heart, trusting God to write those things on your heart. It's good to take notes, and I, I like taking notes, but the Holy Ghost is the best inscriber. He could inscribe something on the walls of your heart, and it's there. And Jesus said he would do that. And so, you know, we, we've been talking about these things. The knowledge of what God said needs to be big on the inside of you. And if you want your faith to be strong, you've got to know what he said. you got to know, Psalms 103, verse 3. You know, it says, bless the Lord, O my soul, starts off in verse 1, bless, and forget not all of his benefits. Verse 3 says, who heals all your diseases. Isaiah 53, the great chapter of the prophetic work that Jesus would come and do. He said he will bear our diseases and our pains and our sicknesses, and with his stripes we are healed. 1 Peter 2, 24 it reminds us of what Isaiah said, that by his stripes you were healed. Matthew 8, 17 reminds us that Jesus came to do what Isaiah said. And it says he bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases, that it might be fulfilled what the prophet Isaiah said. And scripture after scripture, Deuteronomy talks about how he'll, he'll bless your bread and water and remove sickness from the, from the midst of you. I like to remind myself of that before I eat. That's usually part of the blessing when I bless the food. I said, Father, I thank you this food is blessed. It'll be a blessing to my body, even with impurities. Yeah. Amen? Listen, we live in a day now where it's almost impossible to eat totally clean. And if you can do it, it's very expensive. So, you know, I'm not saying this is an excuse to eat really crazy stuff. But, you know, this Wednesday you come to church, we're going to have sliders. You know what we're going to do? We're going to bless those sliders. We're going to pray over them. Sliders has changed. Now it's like a little hamburger. When I was young and we ate sliders, it was a raw oyster. Yes. That was our sliders. <laughs> we're going to bless them. Amen. And there may be some things in there you need to be careful of, but you know what? You know, the Bible says that all things are blessed, amen, through the word of God and prayer. So we can pray over that. Believe God, amen. Because Jesus said, you'll drink deadly stuff and it won't harm you, amen? We can, we can pray and we can believe that our body will, will, will you know, put out and put away all the things that are not good for us and ingest and digest the things that are good for us. Can you believe that? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. If you can believe it, you can have it. Yeah. Amen. So, hallelujah. Don't use that as an excuse to eat and drink anything. But, you know, whatever you have, whatever you have before you, bless it. Hallelujah. And so the second thing, the second pillar that strong faith sits on is faithfulness. You need to understand that the one who said what he said is faithful to do what he said. Amen. And when I was a young boy, I didn't have a, a lot of pictures of, of really faithfulness. You know, now my, my mom was really good to us and, and really faithful to us as children. She did the best that she could do, you know, and trying to provide. My parents were divorced. But I remember as a young child, you know, my dad would, would promise my sister and I, my sister who's a year younger than I am, I'm a whole lot more better looking than she is, but uh, she's, I said that just in case she's watching, but uh, 
I remember my dad would promise us that he was going to come pick us up. You know, we, my mother uh, had to go and, and get a, a job that would support uh, the whole family because my dad was not real faithful at paying child support. Many times I remember my mother putting him in jail. And, you know, it because he wouldn't pay child support. You know, he wouldn't support his children. And he was, he was a, he, he loved, uh, you know, the, the nightlife and he loved uh, uh, the women and things like that. And he was caught up in that lifestyle. And my mom, so my mom had to, you know, get jobs to provide for us. So she got hired with the airlines. And while she was going through getting her seniority with the airlines, we had to live with my grandmother. And I remember my dad would promise us to come and pick us up and take us out to eat. Many times my sister and I would wait on the steps of the front porch, you know, sitting out there waiting on him to come pick us up, and he never would come. Every once in a while he would, but most of the time he wouldn't. He, he wasn't a very good picture of a faithful father. So there was a lot of things that I had to overcome growing up. I didn't have a real good picture of a faithful father. So I had to realize it took a lot for me to renew my mind and build that up on the inside of me that God is a faithful father. You know, a lot of people don't have a real good picture. Maybe you don't have a good picture of a faithful father. There are some people that if you mention father, they don't want to hear anything you've got to say because there's such bitterness there between them and their father. And so, you know, you're, you're, us as parents, not that we have to be perfect, but God uses us to portray the character of God to our children and and our children need to understand that we're not perfect but they do need to learn some things about love and care and concern and compassion and faithfulness and things like that and and we need to understand that that God is faithful and if you don't have a good picture of faithfulness through your parents let me assure you God is not like your parents. God is a father that can be counted on. He is a father that won't leave you sitting on the steps. He won't leave you and abandon you. He said, I won't leave you like an orphan. I, Jesus promised that. And so it, we can, when he tells us something, we can count on him to do that. So I had, that was, a, that was a, a wall that I had to overcome in life is, is, yeah, God has said these things, but I struggle in this area. That he'll do what he said. He won't leave you there. He won't, he won't leave you in your circumstance. He won't leave you there with sickness in your body. He won't leave you there to make it on your own. But he'll come through. He'll do what he said. If you will trust him, he will be there. The power will come. The thing will happen. The breakthrough will take place. God will come through. And so I had to learn that I can trust Him. Because in this life, we, we, we receive and we walk by faith. So if, if our faith is damaged in those areas, we're going to struggle in those areas. We're going to doubt. We're going to let fear come in. We're going to let things uh, uh, affect the, 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 uh, the way we think about the Father. But we have a Father. I love the songs that we sing in worship. He's faithful. All of his promises are really yes and amen. I mean, really, if you go to God with a promise, the answer will never be no. Never. And, you'll, and if you'll trust him at, and take him at his word, so you've got to know what he said, but then you've got to know he's faithful to do what he said. If you'll take him at his word and, and, and hold fast to what he said, he will always do what he said as brother lee said we're in covenant with this god he chose to make a covenant you understand with a covenant it removes uh the the, the party that makes a covenant it removes them from the responsibility of having to choose so if i come in a, a co if i make a covenant with t and i tell you now everything i have in this covenant now belongs to you. So everything that I own, every resource that I have, we're in covenant together because in a covenant you become one. So now he can come and partake of everything that I have 
without asking. In fact, asking to get permission would be a slap in the face. Because I've already told you that everything I have is yours. Right? That'd be like going to work for a company and they give you a, 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 a credit card to fill your car up every time you need gas. And every time you need gas, you get on the phone and you say, hey, I know I got this credit card, but I just want to ask you, is it okay to use it? I mean, they're going to think you need to be committed to an insane asylum or something because eventually, they're, they're, and they're probably going to let you go because of your incompetence because you can't even use a credit card. They told you, use it. You have access. You're qualified. You're hired. You can have this. You can, whenever you need gas, fill your car up. But so many people don't realize the, the strength of the covenant that we have with the Father, that he has removed himself from the place of having to choose anymore. God is not choosing who will be healed and who won't be healed. Here's the amazing thing. When he made covenant with humanity through Jesus and everybody that accepts Jesus gets in on that covenant, now he has removed himself from the place of choosing. He chose in Jesus. And he said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's not in heaven choosing who will be saved. He chose in Jesus. And now it's up to an individual to hear about the goodness of God and respond and, and receive from what he said because he said it. Take him at his word. He's not choosing who will be healed. He chose in Jesus. This is the gospel. This is the good news. He removed himself from the place of choosing. And he, he, he gave it as a gift to all of us and, and, and gave you access and qualified you to partake of it and so now, God is waiting for you to receive. Amen? So if I wake up in the morning and T's going through my backyard looking for a lawnmower, I don't run out there and go, hey, what are you doing? He would look at me and go, what do you mean what am I doing? I'm looking for my lawnmower. <laughs> Your lawnmower? Yeah, my lawnmower. We're in covenant. Oh. See? When you're in covenant, yeah. it's different because you don't need permission anymore. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You don't need permission from God to be healed. Yeah. Amen. And it's a slap in the face to God. Yeah. When we come, and a lot of times he's merciful and he knows that we're ignorant and he will... He will <laughs> put up with a lot of unbelief, unbelief when we're young, but he expects us to grow up. He expects, he expects us to learn to use uh, the benefits of the covenant and come and receive what you need. Amen? It's his invitation that says come boldly to the throne room and, and receive or take grace and mercy when you're in time of need. That's his, that's his idea. Why would you knock on the door of the throne room? When God said, come boldly, come on. why would you, why would you, you know, uh, uh, just crawl up to the throne as if you need permission when God has said, by my stripes, you're healed. That's a covenant promise. That's a covenant promise. And so when, when he made covenant, he removed himself from from the place of decision. Amen? I mean, Lisa and I are married. We're in covenant together. If she wants to go buy something, my money is her money. She doesn't, she doesn't have to ask me. That's, because we, we're both on the checking account and our money is common, we want to let one another know, hey, I'm going to just want to let you know I'm going to be spending this, this amount of money here. But she doesn't come to me and say, oh, dear husband, good and faithful father that you are, and wonderful husband. See, she's, she's trying to butter me up so that she can spend some money. It's her money. Why would she need to do that? Some of you husbands need to get a grip. You know, your, your money is your wife's money. 
You're in covenant together. Now, I know you can have agreements of how to spend and things like that, but you're, you know, you, you know, you, your wife, you know, you, and, and, and husbands, you know, you shouldn't have to perform to get into a place of favor. It's quiet in, in this <laughs> Pentecostal church. But yet, that's, a lot of times with God, that's what we do. We're, our, sometimes our praise and worship is just, uh, you know, an exercise to perform to get into a place of favor with God. You're in favor with God because of Jesus. You've got his attention. You've got his favor. You're in covenant with him. Amen. Be bold. He said, come before the throne with what? Boldness. Boldly. Why? Because you belong. It's just not somewhere that you can come whenever there's an invitation. You have an open invitation to come and get grace and mercy anytime that you want it. And the one sitting on the throne is not sitting there scrutinizing you, looking at your life, yeah. upbraiding you, yeah. seeing if you qualify, seeing if you've done enough, seeing if you've prayed enough, seeing if you've you know, been in the, in the Bible enough, read the Bible enough, see if you've been going to church enough. He's not, he's not giving you all these good marks to measure your place of favor so that when you need something, eh, okay. No. Here's the amazing thing about covenant is that God removes himself from the place of decision. He's not deciding anymore. He decided in Jesus. And if anybody will call on the name of the Lord, they can be saved. Anybody, no matter how bad, no matter what their past is, no matter what they've done, rape, murder, robbery, whatever they've done. If they will come to God and repent of that and say, Father, I'm coming to you to receive Jesus, he will in no way cast them out. Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter what they've done. Amen. Amen. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Isn't that cool? You know what, you know what the, the really cool thing is? Because he's willing to forgive us like that, he says, now you turn and you forgive one another like that. No matter what they've done, forgive them. Why? Because you've been forgiven like that. And you can forgive. And so... Thank God. I, I mean, I, I'm not saying I've arrived, but man, I've, I've come to the place where I believe that God's faithful. And he'll do what he said. He won't leave me sitting on the steps anymore. I don't ever have to worry about it. First John, did I tell you to turn to Colossians? Let's just drive by First John. <laughs> on our way to Colossians. Is that okay? <laughs> because strong faith sits on the promises of God, knowing what he said, it sits on the reliability of God, the character, the faithfulness of the one who said it. But here's the, the amazing thing, and here's where I believe most people struggle. Most people struggle when they begin to look at their own life. And they, they begin to feel unqualified for the blessings of God because they have not lived such a good life. And I'm not a prophet. I'm a pastor and a teacher. But I can tell you something about your life. You ready? You've missed it in a lot of ways. <gasps> he must be prophetic. No, actually, it's because I'm one of you. you got a lot of faults hang-ups, habits. A lot of those things are being transformed, but some of you, that transformation is not complete yet. 
And so there's still a struggle in some of those areas. And so we can look at those areas and we can base receiving from God on our qualification, even though the promise is made to us, and even though we have a faithful father to do what he said that he would do, when it comes to the equation of you and God, a lot of times you pull out the magnifying glass and the Sherlock Holmes hat, and you begin to magnify all the things about your own life, and the enemy will always oblige you and jump on your shoulder and say, that's right, you haven't done so well, and you're actually not doing so well. And so I know God said all these things, and I know he's a good God and faithful and all that religious stuff that you talk about and confess, but we're talking about you. We're talking about your life and your life is not so good right now. That's what the enemy will do. And uh, a lot of times it doesn't, the enemy doesn't have to do it because we're real good at doing that to ourselves. <laughs> Turning the magnifying glass on ourselves and looking at all the things that we're doing wrong and coming to the conclusion that, yeah, God said that, and yeah, God said he, he will do what he said, but there's some things going on here, <laughs> Right? And we don't realize what qualification is based on. And so 1 John chapter 18, I'm going to read this from an old translation called the Living Bible. How many of you remember that green hardback? Maybe you have one. Living Bible. Remember that? It's actually not a translation. It's a paraphrase. You need to be careful about paraphrases and translations. Translations are works that have been translated from the original Greek into a language that you can understand. And, but a paraphrase, and the message is a paraphrase, and, and uh, uh, the passion, even though it says the translation is a paraphrase, uh, to help us understand, and sometimes it does, but you've you got to understand that paraphrase, that, that thinking of how to say it is coming through somebody's mind. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. We want to stay with, for our doctrine needs to, be, needs to come from the literal translations of the Scripture. We can have these helps to help us understand, but we always come back to the literal. Young's literal translation is one that's really close to the original translation of the Bible. Jesus didn't speak in King James Version, neither did the Apostle Paul. They spoke in Greek and Aramaic, sometimes in Hebrew, but uh, we need those things translated. So this is the living paraphrase. But it does bring out a lot about what the Scripture means to us in 1 John 4, 18. You've heard it said like this, perfect love casteth out all fear. Right? You've heard that Scripture before? You know, perfect love casts out all fear. But the context here is the context of how perfectly God loves us. Not how perfectly or imperfectly, really, that we love God. Right? A lot of people's love for God is really, if you examine it, it's, it's really more about performance than it is about receiving perfect love. Amen. So, and, and you need to, you know, the Bible says, test yourself to see if you be in the faith. So there's some good tests that you can give yourself to see that if you're in a place where you're receiving the Father's love, or you're in a place where you feel like you have to perform for His love. Amen. And so, uh, uh, a lot of times, our love for God is really connected to a lot of the things that we're doing for God. And real love is never connected with anything that we give to get. Does that make sense? Real love never has any strings attached. Real love gives without expecting anything in return. Let's do a little test this morning. Is that okay? A little test. In your mind, you don't have to do this out loud. Nobody will know. 
But I want you to think about how, how many of you are married? Raise your hand. If you're married, raise your hand. All right. Next time you tell your spouse you love them, or next time they say to you, I love you, don't say it back in return. Just next time they say, I love you, just look at them and go, thank you. And see what happens. <laughs> see what happens. Because a lot of our receiving love is received with an expectation that we have to give something back. That's not real agape love. That's a human kind of love. And it's okay to exchange I love yous. But when God says, I love you to you, he's not expecting anything in return. He just wants to give. He just wants his love to minister to you and make you whole without feeling that you owe him anything in return. So sometimes it's a good test to kind of test it in marriage, you know, and and, uh, you know, I've said this before that I've been on mission trips before where I had to be away from Lisa for, you know, sometimes three weeks, I think maybe was the month, maybe a month, I don't remember, you know, but gone, you know, and, and I'm not with her. And there's a lot of things that we do when we're together to express our love for one another. But when you're, not, when you're away from one another, you know, then you get to experience when the, when the absence of that love is there, there are some things that, that will come up in your heart. So if I'm away from her for, let's say a month, say you had to be away from your spouse for 30 days. That's a pretty long time. And some of you travel and you're used to that. So I, but I'm talking about somebody that's not really used to it. The first time you're away from your spouse for 30 days think about the kind of emotions that would now start surfacing in your heart when the absence of that person is there think about that what, what are some of the emotions that you think you would experience if you were away from your spouse or your children just say you're away for them. you know we, we we love our spouse and I, I love Lisa I I didn't really understand the power of love till Lydia came along when, you're, when somebody is born from you, and man, there's a love. Y'all know what I'm talking about? For your kids? It, it's not that you're comparing love, my love for Lydia versus my love for Lisa. It's not even something that you can compare. Because we're not supposed to love one another equally. We're supposed to love one another uniquely. Right? Don't try to, don't try to raise your kids loving them equally where you get one something, you have to get the other something. You're, you're, you're doing them a big disservice in teaching them about the love of God. Because God doesn't love us on an equal, he doesn't love Greg as much as he loves me. You, you shouldn't even compare it like that. He loves Greg uniquely in the way that Greg needs to be loved in order to grow and be whole in the love of God. He loves Greg that way. He loves me different. He loves me in, in a different way because my needs are not the same as Greg's. And so he, he ministers to me on a way that causes me to grow and be whole in my heart. So God's not into this equal love business. Comparison. But if you had to be away from your children for a month, some of you have sent them off to camp for a week. And you've experienced it in a week. But what about a month? What are some of the emotions that will begin to surface in your life? Think about it. What, what are some of them? Help me out. What? Lo you'd, you'd feel lonely. What, what are some other things? Huh? Concern? Fear? Th that attachment. Would you long to see him again? So there would be a longing on the inside of you to see him. Would you, when you thought about the moment that you're going to see him again, would you get joy? Oh, maybe that joy would even sustain you in that time apart. 
but longing, love. Amen. Appreciation. Reflection on them that would bring a smile to your face, hopefully. <laughs> right? Why? Because it's real love. But when we carry it over to God, a lot of times when, when, we, when we get busy in life and we, don't, we, we miss that time of fellowship with God, what's, what's normally some of the things that surface in our emotions? Huh? I'm not right. Condemnation. Guilt. Shame. Doubt. Why? Let me tell you why. Because you're not really in love with God. See, I had to face that years ago. My mother years ago told me, when I was struggling with some of this stuff years ago, she told me, she said, the problem is you're not in love with God. And you need to go to him and tell him that. You can't tell God that. Don't you think he knows? Some, some of the best things that you can do in your relationship with God is, is to get real honest with him. But it's not for his benefit, it's for yours. He knows. And I remember years ago, decades ago, going to God and saying, God, I'm not in love with you. I've got some crazy version of what love is because when I'm, when I'm not spending that time with you, I'm experiencing guilt where I should be experiencing passion, longing. See, that's, a, that's, a, that's really what love is, is when, when you're away from somebody that you really love, I don't feel guilty when I'm away from Lisa for two weeks on a missions trip. That would, that would kind of be strange, wouldn't it? I don't feel shameful, condemned, because I haven't seen her in two weeks. Amen? But that's the way God feels about you. He longs for you. Amen? He loves you with no strings attached. And he doesn't give you his love listening for an I love you back. I love you. A lot of times we give those things out of oblig obligation. And we don't realize that when obligation, listen to this, when obligation is tied to love, it deteriorates the reality of what love really should be. And it causes us to be established in a love that will give and expect something back in return. Here's one of the greatest things you can ever realize in life. Nobody owes you anything. Well. I just expect every, my birthday, I just expect my family to come together and, and give me gifts and things like that. But let me tell you what you're doing to your family. You're bringing your family into the bondage of obligation. And they're not able to really experience true love and true grace. Because I'm going to tell you something really amazing that's true. Study it out for yourself. But God does not owe you anything. And everything that God wants to do in your life, He wants to do it because He loves you with no strings attached. Which when you realize that it'll set you free from the bondage of obligation. And here's the another, another amazing thing. You don't owe God anything. Because when somebody does something for you out of love with no strings attached and they really did it from the motive of love, then they don't feel like or they're not listening for an I love you in return. It's just to bless you. You don't owe me anything. How many of us have relationships, even family relationships with maybe elder parents where there's obligation there? 
And maybe your parents put you in that obligation and maybe they tell you, well, you, you, you never come to visit me. Yeah. You know? And so when you try to be gracious and you try to love, it's hard to really experience the freedom of what love really is because there's obligation tied to it. You, you can't experience grace when you feel like you're in debt. So if I feel like T owes me something, you know, if I feel like you owe me something, it's just a little, little scenario here. And don't, if, there, if you've had pastors or something in the past that may have done this, don't get judgmental about them. They're just walking in the light that they know how. But if, what if I had the attitude, well, T's been coming to here, you know, for church for a year, and I've been preaching to him every Sunday, and I've been pouring out my heart to him. At least he could serve as an usher in the church. So now, when T volunteers to usher, my attitude is not, oh, that's wonderful that you would give like that. My attitude is, well, it's about time. And see, here's how we feel, and we've talked about this a lot. Nobody in this church owes us anything. You don't, you don't owe us, and you don't owe us, you don't even owe us a thank you, or, because I want everything that I do for people to be out of love with no strings attached. And that's the way we should, and, and I'm telling you, when you get a revelation of love like that, it will set you free. In your marriage, it will, it will take you to a whole nother level of marriage when you begin to love with no strings attached. You don't owe me anything. You don't owe me a gift. You don't owe me a thank you. Your service to me, your goodness to me, everything that you give me. And see, if, if what you're giving is out of obligation, then I'm not experiencing your graciousness you're not experiencing my love because there's debt attached to it. That's why the scripture says, Oh, no man, anything except just to be in a relationship of love with them. Nobody owes you. And the greatest thing, I was in Russia in 2009 when the Lord really brought this home to me. Gave me, a, I mean, it, my eyes were open to it. It was a revelation that I had by the Spirit of God. That scripture right there, owe no man anything except to love him. And the Lord really brought that home to me that nobody owes you anything and you don't owe anybody anything. And when we, when we set each other free and we release each other from that, I'm preaching on healing. wonder why I'm going this way. Maybe the Lord is trying to show you that you're healing has nothing to do with anything that you've done, but everything with what he desires for you just because he loves you. Just because he loves you. You don't owe him anything. You don't even owe him a thank you. I'm serious. I'm speaking for God. And if you don't believe me, ask him. He'll tell you Dane is right. So I tell Lisa all the time, ask him, he'll tell you I'm right. <laughs> but God did everything, everything for us because he loves us so much with no strings attached. His desire for you is just love so much that he sent his son to die for us. And right here in 1 John, he tells us that you can't even know love until you get a revelation that Jesus came and did what he did because God loves you so much. I love all of y'all. You'd think I'd let you come to my house and take her? You know why? Because I don't love you that much. I don't love you enough to take 
my offspring and kill them so you can go free? No. I don't love you that much, but God does. And I don't understand that. I can't wrap my mind around the strength of, and the passion of that love. And that's why Paul prays. He says, I pray, Ephesians 3, that you get a revelation of this. I pray that you'd understand the length and breadth and height and depth of the love of God. Because unless, you, unless, unless God reveals it to you, unless you want to know it and God reveals it to you, then you'll never understand the fullness of God. Because the fullness of God can only be seen in Him doing what He did in Jesus with no strings attached because He loves you so much. Stop trying to qualify for the love of God. Stop trying to earn the love of God. Stop striving. Just rest. That's the song we sing, I will rest. In his promises. My confidence is his faithfulness to this covenant. And it's all because of love. Wow. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. Can I read the scripture? I know, it's, I know what time it is. Verse 16, 1 John 4, it's from the Living Bible, so just listen to it. If they got it on the screen, they can put it up. I don't know if they have this version, but it says, We know how much God loves us because we felt his love and because we believe him when he tells us that he loves us dearly. God is love, and anyone who lives in love is living with God, and God is living in him, and as we live with Christ, our love grows more perfect and complete. See, we start loving other people like he loves us when we get a revelation of this. No strings attached. Oh, and it's liberating. It's liberating to be in a relationship where you feel like you don't owe anybody anything. Oh, it is bondage. It's hell on earth to be in a relationship where both of you feel like you owe me. Oh, set your, set your spouse free. Set them free. Realize, first of all, that God loves you this way. And then make a commitment that I'm going to start loving my spouse. My, nobody owes me anything. Man, there's so much freedom in that. He says, and we live with Christ, our love grows more perfect and complete, so we will not be ashamed and embarrassed in the day of judgment, but can face him with confidence. Hallelujah. With joy, because he loves us, and we love him too. Verse 18, we have no, we, we need have no fear of someone who loves us perfectly. His perfect love for us, see when you see this, his perfect love for us eliminates all dread of what he might do to us. You ever got in a situation where you'd need God to do something and that little thought is there, what if he doesn't? What if it doesn't work out this time? You know what that is? Because you don't know how perfectly he loves you. To leave you in your situation and not come through for you, that's fear of what he might do. But when you understand the perfect love of God, watch this, if, if, if we are afraid, it is for fear of what he might do to us and shows that we are not fully convinced that he really loves us. Any level of fear is just a little area of proof that you're not convinced how much he loves you. But you can be. You can be convinced. You start out by faith, believing the love of God. And when you start believing the love of God, God will start revealing the love of God. You're, it's, your, it's your job to take a step toward him in faith. 
But every time you take a step toward God in faith, he takes a step toward you in manifestation, in reality. If you'll start believing God loves you this much, he'll start confirming it and showing it. And here's what will happen. It will eliminate all dread of what could ever happen. It will eliminate dread of stuff happening to your children. All that fear of what might happen to our children, you know, it will eliminate that. Hallelujah. Set you free from it. Remove it from you. Here's what the King James says. It'll perfect love cast out fear. That word cast means to, to violently thrust something away from you. You know, it, it, it doesn't mean perfect love cast out fear. That's not what that means. If I could demonstrate it and I can't, it means perfect love <laughs> throws it away from you, thrust it violently away from you. How'd you like to live in something so strong that every time fear came and knocked on your door, that what's in you just threw that thing a million miles away from you? It's the power of his love. We were talking on the way to church this morning, and Lisa asked me the question. She said, what, what's the very foundation of faith? Is that what you said? What, what is the, what is, where does it start? And we got to talking about it, and this is what we came up with. It starts with love. The first foundation that, you, that, that real faith starts being built on in your life is that he loves me. He loves me so much that he paid for my sicknesses and my diseases and my sins and, and he removed himself from the place of making a decision anymore so that all he wants me to do is to come and receive with no strings attached. See, if God touches your body and cancer leaves your body, you don't owe him anything. That's a decision he made. That's a desire he has. To love you that perfectly. Yeah. Amen? And I'm telling you, when you get a revelation of this, man, you just sit down. And spiritually, you just sit down. And you just rest from all striving yeah. of all the things that you think you have to do to please God into moving in your life. <laughs> you realize how vain it is. Yeah. And you realize why. When you begin to be justified by your own actions and what you think you need to do to get God to move in your life, Galatians says it, it causes you to fall from grace. Grace is there trying to move in your life, but when you try to earn it, you just distance yourself from it. Why? Because it's not something that you can do anything for. It's only something that you can receive. Receive it. And you, it just pleases the heart of God when a person comes to him in faith and just says, Lord, I'm here to receive. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It pleases God so much when you come to him and realize that you don't owe him anything and he doesn't owe you anything. That's why he gave you all things that pertain to life and godliness up front. That's why he blessed you with all spiritual blessings before the foundation of the world. Hopefully, hoping that you would get a revelation of that so that now the only reason that you have need to come to God is just a fellowship, just a worship, just a walk with him because you don't owe him anything and he don't owe you nothing. He's already done it all. You wouldn't owe anybody anything if they already did it all. Right? And I know there are songs written that say, you know, we owe him and, you know, all of that. That's not what real love is. That's right. Amen? Amen. 